something which we often aim to do here in Holy Family is to give uh, an adult understanding of our faith because very often our faith formation uh, would have been fairly consistent more or less in primary school and uh, may have stopped then after confirmation so it may well be that we may be adults but with still a very childish understanding of our faith and our, our faith may not stand up to the rigor of examination uh, or questioning at all because we still have these uh, very kind of childish understandings of prayer of Jesus the sacraments uh, sacred scripture whatever it may be so when we look at the, the person of Jesus um, it's good that uh, the Lord has presented to us as, as our friend and as somebody we can relate to. That's one of the reasons for the incarnation, that, that we can approach God in a way that we can, as such, I won't say we can understand him, but at least we can almost understand him. We can kind of understand him. At least he's closer to us. If, if, if Jesus was, was purely divine and as such only divine, had never taken on a human nature, how do we relate to a pure spirit, like just a pure spirit? Um, we could try, and Abraham did it, uh, but it's, it's just that, that bit harder. Whereas Jesus, you know, he did what we do, got up every day and had to work and felt hunger and felt tired and got splinters and felt pain and loss and ha had friendships. And, you know, so we can, he can relate to us, we can relate to him much more effectively, even, of course, over the whole Christmas period, looking at God, God as a baby is such a kind of an almost contradiction in terms. God, who's just made himself so small and, and approachable, who could be intimidated by a little child uh, in a crib? So God makes himself very, very approachable. And it's good. That's, 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 that's all good. Uh, another aspect, though, of Jesus' person, which we should be aware of and should understand, especially today, because uh, there are a lot of problems in this particular area, uh, but that Jesus was a priest. That Jesus was a priest, that Jesus was the high priest, right? It's, it's, it's said very, very clearly in uh, our first reading from the letter to the Hebrews, where, if I can just find it now, there we go. Uh, it was essential that he should in this way become completely like his brothers, so that he would be a compassionate and trustworthy high priest of God's religion. So Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus is, is, is a priest, right? He's but not just an ordinary priest, a high priest. And ordinarily, what did priests do? The traditional role for priests uh, was to pray, intercede for their people, and to offer sacrifice in their name, to offer sacrifice for them. The difference with Jesus' priesthood is absolutely he, he, he prays for his people, but the sacrifice Jesus offers isn't external to him. So the tribe of Levi, they would have been the priestly tribe, they would have sacrificed your various lambs or bullocks or uh, doves, whatever it may be. Uh, the priests offered those in the name of the people in atonement for, for sins and for purification. Jesus' priesthood is different in that he is the priest, but he's also the sacrifice. Jesus sacrifices himself. So in, in this, he institutes a, a new way of living the priesthood, right? And then he says to his own apostles, do this in memory of me. So the 12 men that he had around him, he institutes them as, as priests. He institutes the, the, new, the priesthood of the New Testament, which is what we continue today. And, and we continue something of, of, of that priest of Jesus Christ, where what we offer, yes, is external to us, but we also have to unite ourselves as priests to the sacrifice being offered on the altar. So it's, it's this, this link between priesthood and sacrifice is intrinsic. The, the, they go hand in hand. The, the priesthood is there to offer sacrifices in the name of the people. And yet, during the prayers of consecration, the priest says, this is my body. Now, theologically speaking, the priest is speaking in persona Christi, so in the person of Christ. Uh, and yet those, the words that he's saying, he's saying, this is my body, which has been given up, offered up for you. So the priest must unite himself to that sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. We must be other Christ. We must act like Christ. Priests must do so. This is our, our calling. This is our great responsibility before God. 
And we see in the gospel today how Jesus behaves as a priest, okay? Where Jesus is, uh, he's preaching, he's teaching, he's healing. And then when all of that settles and night falls, he gets up early in the morning and goes to pray, to be alone by himself. And obviously when he went off to be alone, he was going off to be with, with his father. So he would go to a, a quiet place to be with his father, to be with God, and unite himself in prayer, unite himself I mean, in, in supplication for those he had met, for, those he was go- for what he was also going to do. He prayed before some major events of his life. He prayed before he chose his apostles, prayed before the miracle of the loaves and fish, and he prays before his passion. So there are certain key moments where we hear about Jesus praying. We know he prayed more than that, but there are certain key mo- moments that we hear about Jesus praying because of something that's going to happen. So he's praying in preparation for something. Truly God and truly man. So he, he, he knows that, that these events are coming. So it's, it's so important for us to understand uh, Jesus as, as a priest and also then for us priests to understand our priesthood in that same light. Uh, I read a, a quotation recently from the Curie of ours uh, who said, a priest goes to heaven or a priest goes to hell with a thousand souls behind him. A priest goes to heaven or a priest goes to hell with a thousand souls behind him. There may be a kind of a, maybe if I could just call it, uh, a kind of a, uh, maybe a kind of a spirit of rebellion against priesthood, or what maybe maybe how the priesthood was lived, which uh, definitely in certain places or in certain circumstances was not ideal, where the priesthood was associated with power, and maybe even with uh, dominion over people. Uh, also, in, also here in Ireland, which is far less than what we're called to do. But we always have to be careful not to throw out the baby, the bathwater, and the tub. Priests should live their vocation humbly, knowing that everything we do, it's a ministry, priestly ministry. The word minister means servant. So if I'm at the service of the Lord, and yet at the same time, we have to balance this, the so, spiritual life in, in, in uh, for us as Catholics, always revolves around balance, okay? On one hand, I uh, humbly know that I'm serving the Lord, and at the same time, I have to know what I must do. I have to know what my vocation is, okay? You can imagine you're standing at a traffic light, and this old lady walks over, and she's struggling, carrying four Tesco bags, and they're full of milk, and she's just kind of barely dragging them, and you're there with your hands free going, I worked out this morning feeling pretty buff. <laughs> Look at that old lady. <laughs> no, you'd say, well, you know, my hands are free, I'll help her. So I have the ability to help so I can help. Or if there's a doctor present and someone collapses, should the doctor say, well, you know, I'm off duty, and I suppose, I mean, we all have a basic understanding of what to do when someone collapses, I suppose. You know, we all know that one should put a pillow under their head. I, so I'll just look, I'll just... I'll just stand back here, just let everybody else at it. Or, you know, if something happens and this is your area, this is what you do, you get stuck in. That's your job, right? You know, like, if you can help, and if the, especially if, if there's something that maybe only you can do, if you're the only person that knows about a certain area and something goes wrong, do it. See a need, fill a need, okay? Now, as priests, we must do what only we priests can do. And that isn't arrogance, that isn't us making ourselves important or anything. This is simply like a, like a doctor seeing someone collapse and the doctor, even though he's off duty, walks over and helps because he's a doctor and he can help. I, as a priest, I must do what, on, what only a priest can do, right? And that is to offer sacrifice, primarily. Celebrate Mass. I must do that. And I must do that well because only I can do it as a priest. You're all wonderful people. You really are. My job here is to offer sacrifice. I have to do that well. Because if I mess that up, none of you can help me. Right? I have to do this well. I have to absolve sins. Right? Because, again, we can get all of your 
UN leaders all together in a room concentrating really hard, they can't absolve a single sin. I must do that, and I must do that well, because only I can do that. And that isn't arrogance, that isn't pride, that's my service. And even blessing, or simple things like, uh, I was talking to someone recently who was uh, at a meeting where there was even a bishop present, and this, this, la this lady said, you know, uh, I think this is, obviously we should begin the meeting with a prayer, but I think it's, it's important also that, that, that everyone prays. So maybe, Jerry, if you want to lead the prayer there, you know what I mean? And there's a bishop there. And then the prayer, the Jerry, sure, look, we ask, we ask God to, to bless the whole thing now, and should it all go well, no one will get hurt. On Ahas Urm, on Rosary Shah at Laka. Amen. And, um, and, and I couldn't help but think, I get her point. Yes, everybody should pray. But don't forget, right, that a bishop is there as a priest. And then the, the blessing that a, that a bishop gives is the blessing of Jesus Christ. So we shouldn't be kind of thrown out the baby with the bow and denying ourselves something good in the name of, uh, you know, everybody praying and everyone being all nice and all this kind of thing. Uh, I remember, this is my personal opinion. I believe Medjugorje is authentic. Okay. But Our Lady in Medjugorje, she says... I'm giving you my motherly blessing. But the greatest blessing you can receive on earth is the blessing that comes from your priests. When they bless you, it is my son himself blessing you. So Our Lady says, if you have a choice between a blessing from Our Lady, and I've no doubt she's way holier than me, right? She's... <laughs> There's no comparison, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Our Lady is just... You know, incredible, incredible. And yet, in just this absolute humility of God, uh, he will grant a greater blessing through the hands of his priest because that's the blessing of Jesus. So that, again, this isn't, this isn't me blowing my own trumpet here. This is how God wishes to communicate grace to you. And for me to say, well, Sherlock, I mean, we're all the same in the eyes of God, that's simply untrue. And then I'm denying people something that they need, God's grace, God's help, God's blessing. And if I say, well, we're, we're all the same, so we're all, we can all just kind of gather on the altar, we'll all just kind of celebrate Mass together. That's not theologically true. It was never the case, ever. It's just made up theology, pure rubbish, and does deep harm to the priesthood. Because then people don't understand what priesthood, why be a priest then? Sure, if we're all the same, sure, like just why be a priest? Just get married and do your thing. So we have to be really, really careful that we, we don't misunderstand uh, the difference between all being a priestly people, yes, and priestly ministry, which is specific and is one of our seven treasured sacraments. Just one quotation here from Thomas Merton. It was sent to me yesterday, but I, 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 it's, it's, it's quite strong. But I like it. If you are afraid to love, never be a priest. Never say Mass. The Mass will draw down upon your soul a torrent of interior suffering, suffering which has only one function, to break you wide open and let everybody in the world into your heart. For when you begin to say Mass, the Spirit of God awakens like a giant inside you and bursts the locks of your private sanctuary. If you say Mass, you condemn your soul to a torrent of love that is so vast and insatiable that you will never be able to bear it alone. That love is the love of the heart of Jesus, burning within your own heart and bringing down upon you the huge weight of his compassion for all of the sinners in the world. If you are afraid to love, never become a priest. Never say Mass. I remember seeing a vocations video years ago made in the States. And uh, this one priest, he was being interviewed, he was a young priest. And he said, uh, sometimes being a priest is hard. Sometimes it's not popular. You have to be a real man to be a priest. And I was sitting there as a seminarian going, hoorah. I love, exactly, exactly. None of this, like, you know, I want to help people recycle and, you know, be nice and um, whatever all that stuff that goes on today. Uh, if you want to be a priest, you have to be a real man. You have to stand up. You have to stand up and be counted. You have to stand up for the Lord. You have to stand up in humility 
and yet knowing who you are in humility and yet knowing the dignity and the responsibility that God has placed on your shoulders. One last quotation, if I may. In Medjugorje, uh, Our Lady speaks uh, a lot to the visionary Mariana about priesthood. And she's very honest as well. She is quite frank about the fact that sometimes priests fall short of the mark. And sometimes priests are not necessarily good priests. This happens, right, because we're human. Uh, and often people come to Medjugorje with prayers and concerns for their own parish priest at home. Our Lady says, do not criticize them. They do not need your judgment. They do not need your criticism. They need your prayers and your love because God will judge them as they were, God will judge them as they were as priests. And God will judge you the way you treated your priests. Now, be careful there to not misunderstand what our, what our lady is saying. God will judge me as a priest, which isn't to say he's going to judge me easier. In fact, if anything, I will be judged more severely to whom much is given, much is expected. If God has given me priestly ministry and uh, priestly power, I have to use that. And I'm accountable to him for how I have used that. And if I haven't, if a thousand souls, if I go to hell and I bring a thousand souls with me, I'm responsible for them. So I will be judged by, by God and more acutely, more, more severely, because I've been given more, as will all priests. Priests need your prayers. The priesthood, there is no doubt, needs a renewal at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of issues which we won't go into. Uh, a lot of renewal needed. The Curie of Ars, St. John Vianney says, the priesthood is the love of the heart of Jesus. The priesthood is the love of the heart of Jesus. So we pray for all priests. We pray for those who are maybe a little older and tired and trying to keep up with child safeguarding and GDPR and financial problems and now COVID issues and are just trying to keep the thing, keep the boat afloat. For those who are young and enthusiastic but are encountering a system which is just maybe slow to, to change. For those who are being told by so many voices, if you just change the church's teaching, everything will be fine. For those who are tempted, for those who are alone, Lord, we pray for our priests. We pray for the renewal of the priesthood. We pray that every priest will know in humility the power that God has given him and his responsibility before God to use that power for the building up of the Lord's kingdom. Lord, we pray for the renewal of your priests. Amen.